Hey everyone, do you remember Cash? No, not the singer, and not the phrase Cash Memory, Google translated one too many times. I'm talking about the physical manifestation of the deeply unphysical idea of money. Over the years, Cash has inspired much mathematical research. But before I get into that, let me tell you about a sandwich and some gifts. One cloudy April morning, I went to get a sandwich from a chain that's hardly relevant to the story. Subway. Uh, the sandwich cost 20 zwote, and I had 100 zwote on me. I knew that later that day, I had to contribute 50 zwote to my class's gift budget. So I stood at the checkout, hoping to get a 50 zwote note, so we wouldn't have to fiddle around with making change with our class secretary. I was lucky enough to get 10, 20, and 50 as my change, nicely showing the popular 125 currency series. I was lucky, since after all, it could have been all 20s, which would have left me without a way to make 50. So naturally, I started thinking about the variations of the situation. For instance, had the contribution been 60 zwote, I could have made it no matter the change I was given. I'll come back to why this is true, but a sneak peek is on the screen. The question I explored on my way back from the shop was, for a given amount of change, what is the highest value I can make no matter how the change is given? Technically, of course, it's however much change I was owed. That's a cop-out answer, so let's remember that we actually mean the second highest value, and move on. Well, if my change is 10, 20, or 50, I could get a single note, meaning no value is guaranteed besides zero and the note itself. 30 can't be made out of only 20s, since it's not divisible by 20, so there must be at least one 10 somewhere in there. If we take that 10 away, we're left with 20, which could be 10 plus 10, or just 20. This is always true. So this maximum value for the given change, m of c, is 20. I went on analyzing these multiples of 10, and the pattern looked random to me, which could only mean one thing, interesting mathematics ahead. This was muddied by the fact that my sequence didn't appear in the OEIS, meaning it was either trivial or, less likely, groundbreaking. I also limited myself to looking at 10, 20, and 50, because more notes and coins seemed like a challenge for later. Look at this table. Really, take a while to absorb what's happening here. You might already have some simple explanations for some of the numbers, like 100, the least common multiple of 10, 20, and 50, giving 0. But can you name a reason for 110 giving 60 and 130 giving 110? Don't worry if you have no idea what's going on. We'll explore this and you'll end up knowing exactly how much you can make without a fuss from any amount of change in any currency system. As you may have noticed, I've been talking about złotys, the currency in Poland. What about euros with the 5 euro note, or dollars with their quarters, or British free decimal currency? Instead of looking into systems as we come across them, we should prepare for anything and search through all the systems there could be, looking for patterns and maybe even formulas. Let's switch to coins because they're cheaper props than notes, and let's call the set of coins we can use S. The shorthand for our function is now ms of c. Let's start with a system with no coins. There can't be any change or any subcollection of it. Basically communism. If we have one coin, the change can only be a multiple of it, and the second largest value will be one coin less than the whole. So m2 of c is just c minus 2. m3 of c is c minus 3. These simple formulas don't hold up the more coins you add. Two coins start to get interesting, but just barely. Let's start with a 1 coin and an n coin. We know that if a number is not divisible by n, it must use a 1 inside of it, because otherwise it would be divisible by n, leaving us with m of c for the set 1n equal to c minus 1 for all of the c's not divisible by n. However, if c is divisible by n, that means we can create it using only coins of value n. We have no guarantee of being able to take away a 1 coin, but we can definitely take away an n coin, or n1 coins, if the change happens to be all 1s. Since c is either divisible or not divisible by n, and we know what happens to it in both of those cases, we can confidently say that we know m of c for the set 1n for all n's and all c's. That are positive integers, of course. With a set of coins of values n and m, there may be some numbers we just can't make. Thankfully, Frobenius of McNugget fame has us covered, or more truthfully, his contemporary James Joseph Sylvester, who devised a formula for the largest number we can't make using two coins. 
Let's also say our coins are coprimes, since any non-coprime set is just an integer multiple of a coprime set, and the values of ms of c are multiplied accordingly. With this assumption, we know that n times n will be the same as the least common multiple of n and m. This LCM can be made either from n m coins or m n coins. We know that there is no overlap between the lower multiples of n and m, since that would be the LCM. So, m of n times n for the set n m is equal to zero. I'm slightly regretting naming my coins after the natural numbers. Now, if we take both n and m away from n times n, we're left with a number that's not a multiple of m or n, since that will lead to contradictions. This n times n minus m minus n is in fact the formula discovered by our friend JJ. We can use this to find the other impossible numbers. Taking any of our coins away from an impossible number must again give an impossible number. Otherwise, adding back that coin would give a possible number, which we already know it isn't. The rest is pretty simple. If c is not divisible by m, that means we must have used an n to create it. Thus, we can take this n away, giving us c minus n as our m of c. If c is divisible by the least common multiple of n and m, then ms of c is equal to c minus that number. This is because we can definitely create that LCM out of the numbers we're given, but we also have no idea whether it's all n's or all m's. The last scenario is c being divisible by m, but not by the LCM. That leaves us with an m of c equal to c minus m. We can now notice a certain periodicity. Above a certain value, adding the LCM to c results in adding the LCM to m of c. This means we're repeating a pattern, but shifting it up every time it repeats. You could think of it as the sum of a linear function and a periodic function telling you how much to adjust that linear function. It's time to tackle sets of three coins. We'll start with a one coin, an n coin, and an m coin. Instead of presenting a formula from on high, I'll go with my primary school instincts and show you a colored spreadsheet of ms of c for a few different sets. Then, hopefully, looking at it, we'll find a pattern, and maybe, if we're feeling adventurous, we'll try to show why that is the pattern. So, we're here in Google Sheets. You're currently seeing the 1, 2, M series with odd-numbered Ms. To one side, there is MS of C, and to the other, C minus MS of C. It's pretty easy to notice the pattern of zeros creating lines. It's also quite natural that below the third coin, the pattern is exactly the same as for the set 1, 2. Looking closer, we see that the higher numbers are dominated by consecutive integers with small predictable irregularities. These irregularities are directly related to the reason there are five zeros visible. Four of them are expected, the coins and their LCM. But there's also one special or unexpected zero which occurs at 1 plus the third coin. This is because both 1 and the third coin are odd numbers, which add together to an even number. And that even number can be expressed with only 2s. That means that there is no overlap between these two possibilities, so the highest number you can definitely make is 0. For instance, with our regular 1, 2, 5 series of currency, 6 can either be made out of three twos or one and five. Looking at the cells containing C minus M of C, a clear pattern emerges. For every C divisible by the LCM, we take away the LCM. For those divisible by M, but not by N, we take away M. Every LCM above the special sum, we take away the special sum. And every LCM above the special sum plus M, we take away M. If you want a satisfying answer as to why this is the case, you can think about the numbers yourself. Which brings me to the question of how I even got these numbers here. Well, I wrote a massively inefficient Python script to find all the collections that add to a number, and then search for the intersection of the values of their subcollection. Using this script, I also generated a few different sets. 
Now we'll have a look at the sets 13M and 14M. As you can see, there are some interesting shapes emerging. We again have zeros forming lines, with the lines having gaps for the even M's in the 14M sets, because the LCM is not the product of the coin. Looking at C minus M of C, the pattern is a bit clearer, especially for 13M. Creating some sort of formula for these numbers is definitely possible, but I don't have the patience to describe every variation, much less to dive into why exactly this is the behavior we see. Going to 14M, we again see there are patterns building slightly on the things we saw for 13M, particularly the sequence of numbers in which we don't take away four in the periodic function is four numbers long instead of three. We also see a lot of ones in the sets where one is the only odd number and thus necessary to create all other odd numbers. Moving on to 15M, we again see stripes of zeros, but the generated data set isn't large enough for us to appreciate all of the pattern. For C minus M of C, we can notice that generally, for sets of 1, n, m, above a certain point, taking away numbers that are not n happens in groups of n, near a nucleus where a zero would be in the first iteration of m of c. As you've seen, we were able to describe the behavior of 1, n, m sets pretty well. Compared to them, even n, m, k sets are complete chaos. You can see them here. We're definitely able to explain some of the patterns, but some of them remain mysterious due to the interaction of our favorite special sum. Sets of more than three coins are going to be even more difficult. After all, they should be difficult because throughout this video, we've been scratching some unsolved mathematical problems from an unusual side. There is no general formula for Frobenius numbers of coin sets with more than two coins. And many problems in this general area of subsets and coins are NP hard. I lied when I said you'd learn about how to deal with change in any currency system, but I hope the 1NM and particularly the 1-2M patterns will be useful to you someday. As an endnote, there are families of coin systems with arbitrarily large numbers of coins which are very easy to model. Their general set formula is 1, N, K, N, L, K, M, and so on. Here, M of C is C minus 1 for C is not divisible by N, C minus N, for c is divisible by n, but not kn, c minus kn, for c is divisible by kn, but not lkn, and so on. You may have noticed that this is not the usual type of content on my channel, and that I'm not a very formal mathematical person. Both of those things are true, but I do love recreational mathematics, and this problem has been sitting in the back of my head for over a year, so I'm really thankful that I was able to make this video for this awesome project, and thanks to every one of you for watching.